We are in 2 Peter, the last chapter, chapter 3. 2 Peter, chapter 3. And I want to mention before we get started on this, this is the, mostly this is pretty much all that Peter addresses about the end time, the, the uh, times in which the millennium and the close of, of the uh, end time. Um, you need to understand, though, that Apostle Paul is the one that revealed the mystery. Uh, he said, Behold, I show you a mystery to the church of Corinth. We shall all, all sleep, but we shall be changed. So it was Apostle Paul that revealed the mystery. The catching away of the church, the rapture of the church, has always been hidden in the Old Testament and hidden even in the time of Jesus. Because when Jesus said at the tomb of Lazarus, he, I am the resurrection and life. He that believeth, believeth in me, though he were dead, yet should have lived. That's resurrection. But then he goes in the next verse and says, But whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That was a hidden mystery. Paul comes along and says, I'm going to show you that mystery. There's going to be a group of people on planet earth that will be alive and they will not die. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in the moment of the twinkle of an eye. We shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So Apostle Paul talked about the mystery of the rapture of the church. Peter talks about uh, to the Jewish people the close of the millennium, the close of the, uh, the, new, the new world that's coming. And so Peter will talk about that in this last chapter. We've been going through First uh, and Second Peter, and um, this is the only place that Peter really addresses uh, the, these end time uh, studies, but uh, I think you will agree that Peter was told by Jesus that he would die. And Peter knew that he would die because Jesus said he would die. Jesus said that he would be crucified. And so Peter knew that he wasn't going to go out in the rapture because Jesus told him he was going to die. Now Paul, on the other hand, knew that there was going to be a group of people that would just be gone. They'll be taken to meet the Lord in the air. Peter didn't have that revelation. And when I share this chapter, Peter even makes a statement that Paul's words were heavy. They were deep and in depth. And I'm thinking, wow. Uh, Peter says, uh, Paul was hard to understand. And then I look at chapter three and I think, Peter, you're pretty hard to understand too in some things. So we'll begin with the first verse of this chapter three, second Peter. It says, this second epistle Beloved, I now write unto you. So that just uh, settles any question who wrote the book. We know that Peter did by the Holy Ghost wrote this first and second. Peter he said, I write unto you in both which to stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Now, the phrase pure minds doesn't mean pure in the sense that we were pure, like, like pure as gold refined in the fire. The, the, the phrase pure minds means totally sincere. I write these things unto you both to stir up your totally sincere mind. In other words, your mind is pure in that area. You've sold out. You're committed totally to the Lord. And that's totally sincere minds by way of remembrance. So he says, I'm going to take you back to the scriptures. I'm going to give you a jump start. I want to show you what um, the Spirit of God is leading me to say through this last chapter of, of, of 2 Peter. Then Peter says in verse 2, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before the holy prophets. The holy prophets there is the Old Testament writers, the books of the Old Testament. That's what the holy prophets are. He said that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandments of us that, and of the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ or the Lord and Savior. And, and there he's talking about, of course, the the 11 disciples minus Judas, he's talking about the apostles. And verse three says, knowing this first, there's something that you need to understand more than anything else, and this is what he says, that in the last days, there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. Now, in the last days, there are gonna be scoffers walking after their own lust, their own desires, their own will, their own, their own ambitions. And they will say in verse four, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they are willingly ignorant of that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now 
by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now let me stop right there and I'm gonna give you the title of the lesson tonight. And basically, basically uh, uh, I'm gonna talk about world number three or four. Which is it, world number three or four? Peter talks about the world that then was. Then he talks about the world that is now. And then he talks about the world that shall be. Now understand, Peter is addressing Jewish people, those that followed the old prophet scripture. So he doesn't have the insight that Apostle Paul had. He's talking to Jewish people that heard the promise of Jesus setting up a kingdom on planet earth and how God would bring in righteousness and it would cover the world and there would be a new heaven and a new earth. And in that light, he's speaking to us that there will be a new heaven and a new, uh, new uh, earth. Now, uh, verse five and six talks about the world that was. The world that was, that's verse five and six. Look at verse five and six. For this they are willingly ignorant. Now, what's bringing this up is scoffers will come, mockers of the, of, of the end time. People will make fun of the fact that we believe in the coming of Jesus. People will scoff at it and they will sneer at it because they think we're just cuckoos. <laughs> we're just out of our mind. And, and they'll, make, they'll, they'll scoff it. And the argument they have is, it's never happened yet. The argument they have is, where is the promise of it was coming? For all things continue as they were since the beginning. And then Peter says, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. All things are not as they were since the beginning. So he shares three worlds, possibly four worlds, to show us that God did in his time bring judgment and bring to pass end time uh, close of different dispensations. So uh, uh, this verse five and six, this they are willingly ignorant because they said since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue. They're scoffers in the last day. And their argument was he's taken too much time. They're willingly ignorant of, of that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water whereby the world that then was, now we're talking about the world that then was. Now, uh, uh, that's what we're talking about, the world that was, the world that then was. Uh, Peter is trying to do a, uh, he's sharing an argument with these people that say, where is the promise of it coming? Scoffing, uh, you know, why is uh, everything continuing as it is? And so Peter's trying to say, it's not that way. Um, what he's trying to say is the world that then was. Now, was it one before the flood or was it possibly before the creation of you and I? There's a possibility that when he talks about the world that was overflowed with water, verse six says, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Now, I think probably he is talking about the flood of Noah. I'd say possibly he is talking about that, but we gotta go back and consider there may have been another flood before that. And the reason there may have been another flood before that is in Genesis chapter one, verse one and two in between. It says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then it describes the earth as being nothing but a, a, a mass of water, a void mass of water. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the earth and he moved and the spirit of God moved and the, the Bible says the waters were separated and the land was separated in one place and the waters were separated into another place. Actually, all the continents were in one place. In the beginning, there wasn't Africa, water around it, Australia. In the beginning, it was just one big mass of land and then a big mass of water and God parted the land from the water and that was the beginning of the creation that we know. But what happened, what made the earth nothing but darkness, void? The Bible says, and the earth was without form and void and darkness is upon the face of the earth. So a lot of people, and I, we call this the gap theory. And the reason it's called the gap theory is because between Genesis one and uh, chapter one and verse one and two, uh, something happened. Uh, I can't picture God creating a mess from the start. I picture God creating something beautiful from the start. And so I think that there was a pre-Adamic world. By that, mean, by that I mean there was a world before Adam. 
There was a world before us. And I don't think it was a world of people made in the image of God. No, sir, we are the only ones made in the image of God. But I do believe that this earth had been inhabited before. Not by humans, not by us, not by Adam. But probably inhabited by angels. And we're probably going to, uh, this is the gap theory that God brought judgment on, upon Lucifer. And if you want to read about it, I'm not going to spend time tonight because of time. But it talks about in Isaiah 14, verse 12 through 14, it talks about the fall of Lucifer. And how Lucifer rebelled against God, took a third of the angels according to Revelation 12. And they re, they, there, was a, there was a heaven split. There was a mutiny against God. And most people, and I agree, that God totally devastated planet Earth between Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and verse 2. Devastated it. And many of the angels were put in darkness, and, many, and of course the angels rebelled against God. And I believe that at that time, God says, okay, I'm going to create an, a, a new earth. And the Spirit of God moves on the face of the waters, the, 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 the disasters already happened. So now we're seeing not one world, but two worlds where we could say, well, it's just one world because it was just Noah. And I do, I do gravitate to it being Peter speaking of the flood of Noah. But I also understand that we're a little naive to think God only existed 6,000 years ago. Come on, guys. Well, we'd be a little naive to think that God only started his work 6,000 years ago. That's really overbearing and, and we're, we are being really, really, uh, we're not being understanding. I mean, come on, God was busy long before we ever come along. And I think God's still creating. I think God is still creating worlds. I think the universe is still expanding. I believe God's busy and he was busy before we came along and he's gonna be busy long after. God is a creator. If you quit creating, you're not a creator. Now, I could say, well, I'm a fireman. Oh, where do you work? Well, I don't work. Well, wait a minute. You said you were a fireman. No, I'm not a, no. Well, so what station are you at? What fire truck do you drive? I don't. Well, how are you a fireman? Well, I don't, I, I'm not a fireman because I don't fire fires anymore. Then I'm not a fireman. If God's a creator, then he's still creating. He's creating in my life. He's creating in your heart. And so I want to say that the world, I think there was a cataclysmic judgment in the universe when Lucifer fell. I think there was a boom. God just shattered him and broke that off and there was a devastation came to the earth. Now Peter taps into this and then he talks about there was a judgment in Noah's day. And so you got the world that then was that stood out of water. Someone say, well, what happened to the land masses? You know, if it was just one big land mass, you know, scientists say it broke off by earthquakes or whatever by time, and it's like a puzzle. Well, what happened? You know, how is there people all over? And I taught on this several months, or probably a year ago, I taught on this, about the Tower of Babel, remember? And God changed and changed the continents, and that's when it happened. God divided the continents, divided all the land, and people were put all across the land, scattered in another language, and that's when that happened. So uh, we have the world that then was, and I think Peter basically is talking about the flood. And he said, these, are, these people that are scoffers and making um, you know, accusations, saying where is the promise of his coming, all things continue as they were. Well, that's just not true. Because Peter says it isn't true. Remember the flood. Peter's saying the scoffers that are saying it's like it always were, they're willingly ignorant. It isn't true. It isn't like it always was since the fathers fell asleep. There has been a judgment in the past. And so he's talking about the judgment, I think of maybe both, but basically in verse 6, I think he's talking about the flood of Noah. And so he says the flood of Noah took place, and when I was a kid, I'd go out. And how, many, how many when you was a kid would go out and break a rock in two and look for fossils? I mean, I quit that since then. Now I just look for fossils in churches. But anyway... But uh, when I was a kid, I'd go out and break a rock in two and find a fossil. Well, those fossils got there because at one time the earth was covered with water. And there was life in that water. And so that's why I believe that there was a judgment and the flood points that out. Someone said, well, where did all the oil come from? You know, where do we get the gas? Where do we get the natural gas? Well, 
when, Noah told, when God told Noah to build an ark, he told him to put the animals in there and then he told him to store food. So I believe when God created the earth, he put inside this planet, this uh, space capsule called earth, I believe he put everything we'd ever need in there. I believe he put oil in here. I believe he put natural gas in here. I, I believe he put food in the earth. I believe he put everything we'd ever need in this earth. And so when he created the earth, and you can read it in Genesis for yourself, he created the waters, and then he created the fish. He didn't create the fish and then the water, right? He created the food, the grass, the trees, the vegetation, and then he created the animals. But he didn't create the animals and then the vegetation. So he created everything for a purpose to supply the need of something else. And so that's the beauty of the creation, Jesus Christ being the creator. So we have the flood that came in Noah's day, and obviously there was a, a flood then. Now Peter switches to this present world. This is world number three, if you believe that there was a world before Adam's, in our world we live in now. There was a world before which was Noah, the, the earth was destroyed, and then the earth was replenished by Noah and by the work of Noah. And then he says in verse 7, he goes to this present world. And here's what he talks about this present world. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word are kept in store and reserved under the fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now here's his argument again. He said there was a world before and God judged it. There was a world in Noah's day and God judged it. And there's a world today and God's gonna judge it. And basically what he's saying, the world that we're in now is sitting on a powder keg of fire. Peter is basically saying the world that now, he said, but the heavens which, and the earth which are now, everybody say now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto the fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So he's talking about the world now is going to be judged. Paul saw it in the great tribulation. Paul saw it in the catching away of the church. Peter saw it in God burning the planet instead of flooding it. Because God put a rainbow and said, I'll never flood it again. I promise I'll never flood it again. But here he says, Peter says, God's going to melt the earth. We're going to get into that in just a little bit. The world that we know today, well, actually not the world we know today, but the earth in the future is going to be melted and dissolved away. Um, let, let's look at this for a minute. And this is the world today. And I'm going to share with you. Let me read verse eight and nine. He says, but, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Everybody got that? With the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Then in verse nine, Peter's still answering the question of the scoffers and the mockers. And they're saying, where's the promise coming? And here's what he's saying. There was a judgment prior a flood, there was a judgment in Noah's day of judge, and there's coming a judgment of fire in the future. And then he says, be not ignorant of this one thing, that God's not in a hurry. One day is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. And then he says, this is the reason, verse nine, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The reason God hasn't judged us yet is he's trying to get everybody saved, trying to get everybody to come in. He's long-suffering, he's kind, he's gracious, he's wonderful. Someone says, well, it's been so long. Peter argued the fact with these guys that said, where is the promise of his coming? These scoffers said, since the father's been asleep, ha, everything's as it always was. And Peter says, it's just been two days, boys. That's what he said. Peter when Jesus died on the cross and went back to be with his father, he's talking about the two days before, at the beginning of creation up to Abraham, two days to the Malachi, and then you're starting another two days from the time of Jesus Christ to the year 2000, or a little over 2000. So you've got 6,000 years. 
The creation that we know of today is around 6,000 years old. Now, what did God say he would do? Six days he would work, and the seventh day he would rest. So we know because we're at 6,000 years, or a little over 6,000 years, we're about to go into that 1,000-year rest. We're about to go into that Sabbath. Jesus is our Sabbath. Now, remember this. When Peter said it's just been two days, one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. Let's look at something that Peter says to the, uh, concerning, um, well, he says that, that the Lord is not slack, and that's the reason he's, he, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's tarried. We'll get into verse 10 in just a minute because you don't want to miss verse 10. But here's what I want you to see. How long has it been since Jesus died on the cross and went back to the Father? How, if, if we're going to count time, how long has it been? Been a little over 2,000 years, right? Two days. Jesus died on the cross, been around two days. If this is the year 2016. Our calendars can be off some, so we're looking at he's been gone about two days. <laughs> that, that takes care of your patience, doesn't it? About two days. He's been gone about two days. Now, Here's what Jesus said to Herod. Now, Herod was a king that was going to try to kill Jesus, and he was furious with Jesus. And the leader said to Jesus, you better beware of Herod, he's going to kill you. And here's what Jesus said to Herod in Luke 13, verse 32. And Jesus said unto them that came to him and said, beware of Herod, he's going to kill you. He said unto them, go ye and tell that fox, behold, I cast out devils, I do cures today, tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Now he was talking about time frame, three days he'd be crucified, but then let's look at prophecy, hidden mystery. Um, he said, go and tell that fox, which represents the world system, go tell that fox. How many believe Jesus cast out devils and did cures and did healing? How how many? How long has he been doing that? Just uh, a few days on earth? No, he's been doing that for right at 2,000 years, today in the mall. So let's read that scripture a little bit better, and let's listen to it a little bit better in the scope of one year as a, as a day, and a day as 1,000 years. Let's look at it again. Luke 13, verse 32, And Jesus said, Go ye and tell ye that fox, tell that fox, world system, evil Herod, Behold, I cast out devils and do cures today, 1,000 years. Tomorrow, 2,000 years. And the third day, I'll be perfect. Are you starting to see this? It's starting to open up to you? Now look at this. Hosea chapter 6, verse 2, the prophet talking about the end times. Hosea said concerning reviving the earth, the Jewish people, he said, after two days, after two days, will he receive us, and in the third day, he will raise us up together, and we shall live in his sight. Israel has never lived in his sight, but they shall. And so after two days, 2,000 years, or a little more, give or take, because you've got 1,000 years span there, after two days, Hosea says, he'll revive us. He'll raise us up. He's talking about the nation Israel. And he'll raise us up and we'll set together in his sight, reviving us the third day. Let's see, Jesus has been gone 1,000, 2,000. Going on the third day. One day, two day, three day. Looks like Jesus could come any moment to sit on the throne in Israel, in his sight. And Israel see Jesus in the sight. So you see how close we see the prophecy. And so Peter's arguing the fact that, no, you're scoffing, you're you don't know what you're talking about. You're ignorant of these things. Because he said our present world is a powder keg. It could just explode in a moment. It, I mean, it's full, of, it's full of gases, it's full of fire. It's, it's just kept in store. And Peter said the earth that we have now, the one we're living in now, is kept in fire. It's just reserved in fire. Now, here's what I want you to understand. There's never been a time since the splitting of the atom 
and the hydrogen bomb and all the bombs that there's enough firepower on planet Earth to literally melt for, uh, Earth, just melt it, just literally evaporize the sea, just literally melt planet Earth with nuclear weapons, with atom bombs, or God could just do it himself with his finger. And it's done. But the Bible says that the world we live in now uh, is kept in store. Verse 7, the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now, uh, they're willingly ignorant of this one thing. One day with the Lord is a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. It's just been two days. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us. God don't want anybody to perish. He wants everybody to come to repentance. Now he comes to verse 10. And he says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Now, Apostle Paul talked about the day of the Lord coming as a thief in the night. Peter tapped into this, and he realized that the rapture of the church, Peter didn't know this, but the, Paul had this as a mystery. Paul said the day of Jesus Christ is when we're caught up to meet him in the air. The day of grace is now. The day of miracle power of Jesus is now. The day of Jesus Christ is now. But the day of the Lord begins at the catching away of the church. And that's what, that's what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2. For he says, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. How many times have you ever heard Jesus say, I come quickly as a thief? How many times have you ever heard the warning that it would come as a thief in the night? Of course, it, of course it's there. And so we see that Paul talks about the day of the Lord will come in the thief in the night. Let me read some more and then you're going to see just how powerful Peter's words are. And listen carefully. At, at verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What's going to be dissolved? Every ma material matter. Everything. The, the sea, the oceans, the rivers, the mountains, everything's going to be dissolved. What, because of that, because the earth's going to be dissolved, what manner, the question, he's asking a question, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? He's saying, because we know that it could all come to a climax at any moment, ought to urge us to live for God and be close to God. Now, once again, Peter's not talking about the mystery because he don't know the mystery. Paul had the mystery, and Paul revealed the mystery which is the catching away of the church. Look at verse 12. Looking for the hastening of the coming of the day of God. Now we see the day of the Lord. Now we see the day of God. So you've got the day of grace, which is now. We're living the day of Jesus, which is the rapture, the catching away of the church. Then we've got the day of the Lord, which begins immediately at the rapture. When the church is removed from planet earth, immediately the earth plunges into total darkness. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. He said, that day shall not overtake you as a thief in the night. We know the time. And, he's, and if you'll read Thessalonians, you'll discover that he said total darkness will, will come upon the earth. So when the church is removed, what's the church called in, in Matthew 5, verse, what is it, verse 26, so, so forth, and there's maybe verse 16. The church is called the light of the, light of the world. So when the church is taken off the earth, immediately darkness falls and the Antichrist steps out on the scene and the judgment of God falls on planet earth and for seven years a great tribulation takes place. And God is thrashing, trying to get people to come to him in the great tribulation. But the church is going to be with Jesus in the air, as Paul talked about, and we're going to be having the marriage supper of the Lamb and we're going to be with Jesus all the time of the wrath of God on planet earth. Church will not be here during the wrath of God on planet earth. God's people are not appointed under wrath. So when the catching away church takes place, that day will not overtake us as a thief in the night. It's going to overtake the earth as a thief in the night. People that don't know the promise of his coming, people that don't understand these coming, they're going to be plunged immediately into total darkness. We're going to be caught up to meet Jesus in the air. At the time we're caught up to meet Jesus in there, immediately the day of the Lord begins. Now the old prophets talk about the day of the Lord. 
And if, you get, if, you, if you're not careful, you'll get real confused with what the prophets said in the Old Testament when they talked about the day of the Lord. In one place, a prophet in the Old Testament would say, the day of the Lord's gonna be glorious. I mean, the glory of the Lord's gonna shine everywhere and it's gonna be bright. And there's not even gonna be nighttime in the millennium. I mean, the moon will shine as the sun and, and, the, and the sun will shine seven times brighter and it'll be incredible. And then another prophet comes along and says, oh, the day of the Lord's gonna be horrible, horrific, great darkness, great judgment, great eclipse and great devastation on planet Earth. So in one place, a prophet's saying, in the day of the Lord, it's gonna be awful, it's gonna be terrible, it's gonna be horrendous, it's going to be judgment, it's going to be death, it's going to be pestilence, and in another place, the day of the Lord is going to be glorious. Which one's right? Both. When I got up this morning, I did what every human being should do. He should not drink a cup of coffee. Every human being that gets up in the morning should drink a soda pop with caffeine. And by the way, I put my clothes on before I did that because I don't like to drink pop naked. <laughs> I took a shower, put on clothes, aren't you glad? And I got all ready to come to church. We had church, two people saved this morning. Isn't that awesome? And so, you know, we had great church, good crowd. Lord bless, I come in sliding in, you know, in the old car. You know, I've had dinner today. I've done lots of things today. Well, in a day of the Lord, there's going to be a lot of things going on. And so the lot of things going on, the day of the Lord is not just an event. The day of the Lord is a time span. Just like the day of grace is a time span. The day of God is a time span. So the day of the Lord begins at the rapture when the church is caught up. The day of the Lord begins with total darkness. Great tribulation, antichrist, judgment from God Almighty, the wrath of God poured out. The church in heaven being married to the bridegroom, coming back with Jesus after the end of seven years, great battle of uh, Armageddon, the great wrath of God poured out on planet Earth. Jesus comes to the Mount of Olives, stands to, st to sit in his presence, as Hosea said, to stand before his people, and Jesus will set up a millennium on earth, and the church will rule and reign with Christ for 1,000 years, and we will be, the church will be running the planet instead of a bunch of lying Democrats or Republicans, right? Notice I put Republicans in there. And Jesus will be the ruler of planet Earth as King Jesus. And for a thousand years, knowledge will cover the earth as the waters do, as the waters do the earth and the sea. And, and for a thousand years, we're going to be with Jesus, and the earth's going to be beautiful. The desert shall blossom. There'll be great things happen, wonderful things happen. And in that day of the Lord, there's the great tribulation. There's a rapture. Of the, well, the rapture of church is the glorious climax of the day of Jesus Christ. The day of the Lord, the darkness, the judgment. Jesus comes back, fights in the battle of Armageddon, takes the devil and bounds him in the bottomless pit for a thousand years, puts the false prophet and the beast in the lake of fire. And for a thousand years, we rejoice while Satan's in the bottomless pit, bound in darkness and chains. And then we rejoice for a thousand years. What's that thousand years all about? That is another day where Israel sits together up in his sight. And God brings salvation to Israel. And Israel is restored to his beauty that God promised Abraham in the beginning. Out of Abraham came to Israel and Jacob, of course, came Israel. And so God gives us the beauty of that. Now, after people are given a chance to receive Christ, the Bible says the devil will, will be loose for a short season. And when he goes out to deceive the nations, those that hadn't been saved in the thousand year millennium, those that had been born during the thousand year millennium will have their opportunity to be saved. And the, those that refuse will follow the devil and when they follow the devil, the Bible says the day of God will begin. I don't know how long that battle of Gog and Magog will be, but it's probably not going to be long because God's just going to fry this place. And that's what Peter's talking about. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The atmosphere will totally dissolve and be melt, melted with, with uh, fervent heat 
and God will purge. Did you know there's germs in the atmosphere? And so God just explodes the atmosphere with fire. He melts planet Earth. And when he melts planet Earth, he removes the sea. Remember the description of the new heaven and the new earth? The new earth had no sea. He removes the sea. He judges the lost at the great white throne judgment. The Christians are already with Jesus. We that are Christians won't be judged in the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment is for lost people. God will judge. Remember the heavens and earth shall fled away and there'll be no place to hide. Revelation 20. And so that's the melting of the earth. And so when, when he melts the earth, earth will still be here, but it'll explode with fervent heat. And that God will create a new heaven and a new earth. He'll judge the lost at the great white throne judgment and every lost person at the great white throne judgment will be cast in the lake of fire, which is the second death. Death and hell will give up their dead. God will judge everyone that's in hell today and everyone that's uh, uh, alive, that's uh, rebelled on God at the day of judgment and they'll be cast into the lake of fire. God's people will be brought in to himself. Remember the judgment of the nations in Matthew 24, that's talking about when Jesus comes, sets up a kingdom, he sorts them out like the sheep and the goats and sets up a kingdom on earth. Now, I, I know I'm pouring a lot out on you real quick, but I want you, Peter poured it out, out on me pretty quick in this chapter three. Understand this beautiful lesson. When God melts this earth, he will create a new heaven and a new earth. Revelation 20 and 21. And when he creates a new heaven and a new earth that has no sea, has no darkness, no night there, according to Revelation 21 and 22, the new city, holy Jerusalem, will come down out of heaven as a, door, as a bride adorned for her husband. And that great city will over, hover over the brand new earth. And that's the world to come. That's the day of God. And the day of God is the day in which the devil's totally gone forever and we live in a new heaven, new earth, and the church actually will live in the new city of Jerusalem. The church will. That's the mansion Jesus promised in John chapter 14. Look at verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness, Verse 14, wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, we're looking for it, be diligent that ye may be found in him in peace without spot and blameless. An account that the long suffering of the Lord is salvation. The long suffering of the Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul. Now here, this is cute. I mean, this is totally amazing. Peter's saying, according to the long suffering of our Lord Jesus is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to wisdom giveth unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of things which are some, which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures under their own destruction. I think that's so cute. Peter, Peter says, Paul's writings are hard to understand. <laughs> I, I just thrilled with that. I, mean, I, I, I giggle when I think about, Peter said, well, you know, Paul's really hard to understand. <laughs> we wrestle with that. And I think Peter was probably wrestling a little bit about the rapture and the catching away because he was reading these scriptures too. And the mystery was being revealed. So he was seeing that too. But Peter was looking at, at the end time, the focus of the climax of the end, the new heaven and the new earth. And so let's look at something else and we'll about wind down here in a minute. Verse 17, he says, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know things, things before, um, beware lest ye also being led away with error uh, of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. I trust everybody in this room has some steadfastness. Steadfastness. That's why we had such a good crowd this morning. Folks had steadfastness. Verse 18, but grow in grace. Notice it does not say Aging grace. When you age, you get crippled and don't want to do nothing. When you age, you get old and lose your fears. He says growing grace. Growing in grace makes you still full of energy. Makes you grow in knowledge. Makes you grow in faith. Makes you grow in love. Makes you grow in excitement. 
but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Now, after the war, General Douglas MacArthur, after the war, here's what he said because it was such a devastation with the bomb and so forth, the bombs and the riddle. Douglas MacArthur said, we have had our last chance. We have had our last chance. So Peter deals with the world that then was, the present world that we live in now, and then he talks about the world, the future world that will come. And so I hope you understand what I'm saying. When we get into Thessalonians, you will discover that Paul is adamant about saying the day of the Lord begins in darkness. It begins with devastation. And I'm here to tell you, when the day of Jesus Christ reaches his climax and we go to be with the Lord, the day of the Lord begins. And it's great judgment, it's great wrath. But there'll also be a millennium during that day of the Lord. Because not, not everything in your day is bad and ugly. So there's going to be a thousand years in that uh, millennium. We'd call that a day. But, you know, uh, he's, he's calling the day of the Lord. In the day of the Lord, most of the devastation in the day of the Lord is going to be in that seven-year period. And then a thousand year to sit in his peace and in his reign. And then that day of Gog and Magog, I don't think that's going to be much of a battle when God stands up and melts the whole place down. But it'll be a judgment time. Now, uh, I'm sure there may be some questions tonight. And I, we want to give you a chance to make it. Dave, you want to get a mic and, and bring it down? And if you have a question, raise your hand. If you have a comment, raise your hand. And we'll see if we can't answer any um, conflicting or question. I, I mean, come on. This, when you get into Peter, he's talking about the end time, really the end time. We call the end time the rapture, but he's talking about really the end time when the whole earth melts with fervent heat. And so if you have a question, raise your hand or a comment, just raise your hand and he'll bring you the mic and you can comment. I just got a little comment because I, Basically, I can find up to disagree with what you said. I, I love it. You know, uh, going back to the when man was created with Adam, the pre-endemic creation, and I believe there was. Uh, whether they were angels or what they were, I don't know. Don't really care. But what I like, what you know, Noah was given a promise that they wouldn't get after that. No flood. That's right. Yeah. Uh, the rainbow, he made a promise that the world wasn't going to be destroyed that way again. I just, I just appreciate that. I think he did a great job. So he must it. have done it again if he promised he wouldn't do it again. <laughs> yeah. All right. In this 10th in this verse where it says, Our heavens and earth shall pass away, they shall be destroyed. Uh -huh. I was teaching an adult class one time, and this man argued with me. He said the earth would not be destroyed, just the things that was in the earth, on the earth, that's all that would be destroyed. And I brought him to this verse right here. He still wouldn't, didn't get it. Well, you know, I think probably maybe the core might be left, but it'll just be molded lava. I mean, I mean like there was something left after the judgment in angels, right. when the fallen angels, there's water left. There might be some burning sulfur left or something, I don't know, but before he recreates it. But I agree with you, yeah. The Bible says that heaven and earth fled away, so that means it, it got out of there real quick. It's gone. No place to hide, the Bible says. I just want to say that I read this article of Ted Turner. Do you know who he is? Yeah, okay. somewhat. Mm -hmm. He sort of owns a lot of TV stations and stuff, and he's very rich. And his thing about heaven and hell was, I think heaven is going to be so boring that I'd rather go to hell where all the excitement will be. And I said to myself, I cannot believe people think like that, but that's the way this world's going now. I don't doubt that he may have said that. I'm, I, I didn't hear him say it, but if he did, he's an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the bottom line. And, it, and I mean, if you're burning, you ain't gonna be partying. That's just the bottom line. Yes, over here. 
I, I missed two things. Uh, John 14, you said something about the mansion there and how that correlates. Okay, remember when Jesus Christ said in John chapter 14, verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in me. Believe, you believe in God. Believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You got him preparing us a place, got him coming back for us. Okay. And then um, I missed, a, was it Hosea chapter 6? What else did you say? He said he'll lift us up together in his sight after two days. Let me give you that. Hosea chapter 6, verse 2. After two days, he's speaking to the Israel. After two days... Will he revive us, and in the third day he shall raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Now he's speaking to Israel there. He's not speaking to you and I. He's speaking to the nation Israel there. And that's connecting with the millennium, the thousand-year reign, where Jesus sits on the throne in Jerusalem and rules for a thousand years. Okay, and is that showing us, when, like when he's given that example of where he's speaking to Israel, is that like an example that he's how he would talk to us today too well he, he he did talk to us in some way when he said go tell that fox today and them all i do cures and the third day i shall be perfected but see all this stuff in the old testament the prophets and apostle paul and jesus even his words the mystery was that the church was born and the jewish people never saw the church born I'm talking about the Old Testament Jews didn't never see the church. The Old Testament Jews never saw John 3.16. Okay. This was a revelation that would come later that God would have a people other than Jews. God would have a people other than Israel. And that people is the church of Jesus Christ. It was a mystery on what God would do with that church. Okay. That answer your question? Pretty cool. And there's hidden mysteries in the Bible and Paul revealed those hidden mysteries. Anybody else? Or we're going to shift into the tonight's service all right god bless you get around and greet one another and we'll get into something different next sunday night